No idea what they were going to do with me and they're thinking we've got this part one student who's no use to us, who will probably take six months to bring any value to the organisation. He's just going to be in the way. So they sent me off to St Giles that morning because there was something happening and I got the tour and got shown around and I worked on St Giles for about nine years on and off from then on. Is that right? Yeah. Architects traditionally, we're, we're not good at business. Um, there's an awful lot of architects you'll see who don't succeed in businesses. We get really caught up in the design. Design's a really difficult thing to price um, because they're so caught up in the getting the design right and the beauty of it all. I, I don't like architecture traditionally, you know, it's a, the more all-nighters you've pulled, then the better you are at your job and all the kind of kudos. We don't do that. I, I, I've never done an all-nighter in my life, never done one at uni, have no intention of doing an all-nighter for work. You just don't produce well. And he phoned back an hour later and said, but it's yours. I had to agree to one thing, hope it's not a problem, but we need to close before the end of the financial year. And that was the Easter weekend. So it was three and a half weeks. And I was like, and he said, is that a problem? I said, well, I'll be fine, won't it? So then I phoned the bank manager and said, look, I've just bought an office. If you have been enjoying listening to the stories of entrepreneurs across Edinburgh, then why not subscribe? If you're on YouTube, you can hit the red button down below and hit the bell to get notifications. Or if you're listening on Spotify or Apple, then subscribe to the podcast. We hope you enjoy the show. Ali, thank you for joining us today. Great to have you. Thank you. So um, let's start. Tell us a little bit about your story. Tell us where you're kind of at just now. And then we can kind of delve back into kind of how it will be. Perfect. Going. Okay. So um, I'm the managing director of Aiken Turnbull Architects. We are based in Edinburgh, Galashiels and Dumfries. Uh, we're 26 strong. And we have grown out of being your local borders building uh, architects practice. We were the, the guys in the town who there was an architect and someone that helped and we would do everything from your granny's extension to the factory down the road to something on the Tweed Mill or whatever those happened to be. Um, we, we go back to 1887 as a business. So it's obviously not one I set up. Mm -hmm. um, and we've just been one of those practices that's gradually just grown and grown out of the borders. Um, really from the days of those mills and, and the real money around about Hoyk, we were starting Hoyk. Um, and from there, we've just developed the practice out. I've been there since, ooh, I've been there for 13 years this year, according to LinkedIn, so it must be true. <laughs> it pinged up last month that I'm now here for 13 years um, and joined as just an architect. Came mm -hmm. in as just one of the team, um, with an opportunity to maybe develop a studio in a small place out of Edinburgh. And that's just just grown through various, I suppose, opportunities that have come up in the way. Um, mm -hmm. Some unexpected, some planned. Some of the planned ones didn't work out as usual and the really unexpected ones did. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I'm now sitting as, a direct, as the managing director um, with a team who we have fewer studios than we used to. We're now sitting with three studios rather than the five we had when I joined, but they're bigger and... And we've changed, probably in the last four years, we've changed the whole profile of what we do, hmm. the kind of work we do, the kind of people we are, our approach to things um, over that time. And what kind of work do you do then, Ali? So we work in five sectors. Um, we used to be a general practice, so we did everything. Mm -hmm. um, and, and general practice worries me because I think it suggests that you maybe don't know a lot about what you're working in. Uh, you do your best, you get by, you, you try and get through it. What we've found traditionally is that we... Our industry is based on knowledge. If you if you know your sectors, if you know what you do and you have real experience in them, that's where you get value. That's where you give value to clients. It's where you get value as a business to yourself. Um, so we now work in health, living, which is anything to do with residential, workspace, community, and leisure. Those are the five sectors we work in. And it's because we've got a heritage in them. Uh, we, we've done a bit of education. So we've, we, we do little bits around the edges and other things, but we really focus on those five where we've got someone who knows the sector well, who's known in the sector, who can speak knowledgeably about it. Mm -hmm. um, people think what we do is we design buildings. What, what we really do is we answer clients' problems. Mm -hmm. uh, if it's commercial, we go in and find out what the issue is, what's stopping that business succeeding. Is it their space? Is it badly configured? Uh, if it's production related, does it, is it just a really odd production setup where they've compromised over the years? In healthcare, you know, nurses and doctors live with the buildings they're given mm. and they provide a great service, mm. but it's often in spite of their environment. So mm. we see ourselves as problem solvers who so go in and try and address that through buildings. Um, and, and that really means you need to know your sector inside out. You need to know mm. what matters, how it ticks. You need to understand if it's healthcare about infection control and, and all those kind of sides mm -hmm. of it. So that's why we've chosen to be not a general practice, but a specialist in multiple sectors. 
Great. So take take us yeah. back to the beginning then. How how did you end up in in this industry? So how did I end up? When I was in final year at school, I couldn't decide what I wanted to do when I grew up. So uh, back end of the 90s and my brother was studying geography in Aberdeen and it sounded really interesting. So I applied for geography and architecture because I thought buildings were quite cool. Um, and I went to open days and I went to the Aberdeen open day and the, the same time thought I'd maybe go and try the Scott Sutherland School, which was at Robert Gordon's. Uh, for architecture. So I applied there as well and met on day one, the tour I happened to go on, on that open day was led by the guy who'd set up a course that was a focus, it was, it was interior architecture. So it was a combination of interior design and architecture, but it was fully accredited as an architecture course. Mm. So it was much more about people. It was much more about, I suppose, that thing I was talking about earlier of understanding those problems, how people react to spaces, not, I'm going to put a big building here and how will it look? But how does that impact me? How does that feel? Mm. What does that do to me in terms of surroundings? Um, and just in the 10 minutes I chatted with him, thought, I really want to do that. Mm -hmm. um, he was one of those just really inspirational people. Um, so decided to ignore the geography part, which I'm eternally grateful for, um, mm. and <clears throat> focused quite hard in the second half of that sixth year period on actually what do I need to do to get in because I never really thought about doing this. I hadn't done arts in standard grade. So didn't really know what I was doing and they said it was a requirement. So muddled through it and, and got in to that guy's course. Um, and that was the bit that kicked it off. It was just that interest in how do environments and spaces impact people. Mm. Um, he then progressed and went on to be head of school and laterally dean and he's just moved jobs and he's now, he's still at the university, but he's doing something completely different about sustainable development. But he was just one of those people that I overlapped with at various points through my career at uni and at the points when I thought, really, do I want to be an architect? I'm not sure it's for me. Um, he would encourage you to keep doing it and, and, and carry on with it. Um, the way our course is structured as well, you, you do a year out in fourth year and you go and work in industry. Hmm. So I did three years at university and most years thought either I need to leave Aberdeen because it's cold and grey. Um, <laughs> I know you were at school there, Alan. Mm, I was, yeah. What I found was that the, the, the year, well, you went for open days and it was in the summer and it was beautiful and it was bright and it was sparkly. Yeah. <clears throat> but as a student, you weren't there for four months of the year. You were there all winter when it was gray and dark and wet and miserable right. and freezing cold. <laughs> so every year I thought I should go somewhere else. Mm -hmm. And I never quite got around to it, mainly because of that tutor and a couple other tutors that I got on with. Mm -hmm. um, and the year in industry just came at the right time for me. Mm -hmm. I went to work at a practice mm -hmm. down at the shore in Leith, mm -hmm. uh, right above the kitchen restaurant although mm. it wasn't there at that point. Mm -hmm. uh, and they just threw me into things and let mm. me get on and try. Uh, I arrived a week before they thought I was coming. Um, and as a result, they didn't know what to do with me on my first day. Sorry, you, you, you arrived a week before they thought you yeah, were so to Yeah, so I'm <laughs> convinced to this day that I went the day I was meant to start. <laughs> but there seems to have been a little bit of a breakdown in communication at their side. And they all thought I was starting a week later. So when I arrived, <laughs> they had nothing lined up for me. No idea what they were going to do with me. And they're thinking, we've got this part one student who's no use to us, yeah. who will probably take six months to bring any value to the organisation. Mm. What are we going to do with him? He's just going to be in the way. And at the time, that practice was doing all the work in St Giles Cathedral. So they sent um, me off to St Giles that morning because there was something happening and it was close. Yeah. And I got the tour and got shown round. And I worked on St. Giles for about nine years on and off from then on. Is that right? Yeah. Wow. Um, whenever I had a summer job or went back, I, I joined the practice after leaving uni. I left again. I joined again. Um, and I always did a bit there. And just seeing it done by hand on an old building and someone actually grafting away on it and turning a lump of stone into a piece that fitted in and replaced it was just, it just captured my imagination. It, it moved from just being about people and how they felt about spaces to being actually a craft and and the kind of making something permanent mm. and and something like St Giles is you took a stone out to replace it and you saw another layer behind that was medieval and there was another bit behind that and just that sense of history that you didn't really feel you got in other things mm. you know you normally you sat at a computer you drew lines on a computer screen you printed it out it went away and you never saw it again um but seeing that in 200 years or 300 years there's still something there and it's yeah. still impacting <clears throat> that was really interesting to me um and the guys i worked with were great really good team just a really normal balanced bunch of people um and that 
as I said, just was the right point in my career to make me think, actually, I'm going to keep doing this. I really do mm. enjoy it. Went back to do the next two years and finish mm. off all the qualification side. I knew what it was about and knew why I was doing it and knew that there was something beyond the interest to me. Yeah. Uh, I suppose so many folk, you go to uni, you come out and you don't know what you want to do for a living. Um, I'd had to decide when I started if I wanted to do this because it's, it's at least seven years till you're qualified. Yeah. You get to the end of that and think, I don't want to do it. You feel like you've wasted quite a long time. So yeah. it, it just worked for me that, that the way it's structured, I had just the right gap of the real world back to uni. Mm -hmm. I got a job offer when I left with the practice I'd been with. So it just seemed like a natural thing to go and mm -hmm. work with them. Uh, and there pivoted into healthcare, just started mm -hmm. doing, it was just at the point they were starting to build new GP practices and a private company built them and the GPs were in them and you were joining up a doctor's and a dentist's or maybe two doctor's practices. Oh. Um, and I got in right at the start of that and just started doing quite a load of those and moved into some hospital work. Uh, and, and just from there really built without meaning to an expertise and just grew into it and found myself as a healthcare architect having really never meant to and started my first day on St. Giles Cathedral thinking, I, I never thought I'd be dealing with an O, but I had no idea yeah. what to do. And along the way, designed pipe organs and all manner of odd things around the world, you know, just as that's what the guys did. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Superb. Yeah. And just a quick, quick question then, because as you mentioned St. Giles, I was just going to say, you know, are, are there any big iconic buildings in Edinburgh that you've been working on that people would, would oh, know? Big ones in Edinburgh. <clears throat> it's always a funny one. Um, so yeah, I worked on St. Giles for a lot of it. Um, I worked on probably not so much massive iconic ones that people remember. Um, I did a bit on, not the Scottish Parliament, but immediately behind the Scottish Parliament, there's the there's this big apartment development called the Park mm -hmm. um, that mm -hmm. you drive up when you drive through from the um, from the park itself. You see them. So I worked on that for a while. Mm -hmm. um, worked on quite a lot of health centres in and around Edinburgh. Yeah, uh, and on at the Western General, I did quite a bit of the Western. Yeah. So probably spaces people have been in rather than yes. big iconic things people have yeah. maybe mm -hmm. witnessed. Um, I did a bit of work at the Castle as well yeah. for a while. So. Yeah. A lot of those kind of things. It's quite yeah. often you find those big iconic ones are these huge name practices, um, yeah. and uh, and you don't always get you don't always get the same in, involvement in them. It's maybe someone out of London who's never seen it and yeah. does a sketch yeah. and sends it off, and yeah. someone yeah. does it for them. So yeah. yeah, you talked a bit about this the kind of the the stone masonry yeah. work in, in yeah. St Giles as well. Did you, is there more about that? Yeah, I suppose it's it's a funny one. It's. I'd come out thinking I'm going to do, well, I'm, I'm there as the architects. So I'm not qualified yet, but, you know, we're the architects for the cathedral. I'm going to be involved in this job. And um, we've, we've done the drawing. So we were doing window replacements at one point. So we basically took all the window, all the stained glass windows out of St. Giles. Piece by piece, they got removed, taken away. If they were cleaned, if there was a broken piece of glass, it was replaced. There was this little company down in Ayrshire, I think they were, had a converter church. And they had, every time a building was going to be knocked down or demolished or the windows were getting removed. They went to it, they bought the stained glass, they cleaned it up and they categorised it. So they replaced a little bit of broken blue glass with a piece of blue glass from the same era. Wow. Oh, it, wow. it was phenomenal. That's cool. So we took it all out and then we had to replace the stonework. And it's really delicate stone yeah. tracery in St. Giles. And I had to draw them. So I, had to, I, was, I was very bottom of the pile in the practice. <laughs> so I had to go and measure the windows by hand, hand survey them all, work on those. And in doing that, had to then drop the bits where they were maybe very damaged and need replaced. And then on site, they had a little stonemason's workshop. They were carving those stones to replace them. And I was there as the architects. So, you know, I thought I've got to tell these guys what to do. So gave them the drawings, showed them what was to be done and then stood to watch it. I'd never seen a stonemason work in my life. Um, and the stonemason was telling me what he was doing. So I felt I had to contribute and, you know, put my two pence worth in. So I told him where I thought he was wrong and I told him maybe how he should do it properly. And he looked at me and, and he said, are you sure? Said, yeah, no, no, that's exactly how it should be done. You need to cut it this way. And so he went, okay, we'll do it your way, sir. And he started and it just crumbled and it fell apart. Uh, and he looked at me and I went, well, it's, you know, it's, it's clearly bad stone. It's it's obviously not my instructions because, you know, we're the architects, we were doing. <laughs> so you, it's, it's, it must be a flaw in the stone because, you know, the, the veining in it. So he looked at me, really suspect. We'll do another one. So he started again. And it broke. And he looked at me again. And I went, Do you know, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna leave you to this one. <laughs> you tell me. So he showed me how it should be done. And uh, and weirdly his didn't break. His was absolutely <laughs> fine, even though there was as much veining. Um and, and it's those those little bits, I suppose. I was probably 
20, 21 years old. Yeah. Convinced I'd come out of that. It's like leaving school, isn't it? You think you're at the top of the tree. I was, I'd just gone into my year out. I knew as much as I could do at degree level about architecture. I'd been on site for a few months now. You know, none of the guys I'd studied with had ever been near a building site. They were drawing tile schedules for supermarkets and things like that. I thought I'd nailed it. Uh, and then that realization of this guy's been carving stone for 40 years. He knows exactly what he, he knows what stone's going to do. He knows which bit to hit. He knows how to cut it. Yeah. And here's some 20 year old going, I think you'll find this is the correct way to do it. And then obviously it was completely wrong. So yeah, I think those little bits that just remind you of, yeah, we, we are, whilst I don't like being, I wouldn't say we're a general practice, we're not anymore, but even though we're specialists, we don't know as much as the guy on the ground or the girl on the ground that's actually doing it. Yeah. Uh, that mm-hmm. person that spent their life on it. Also in St. we worked with some people who were conserving the stone and they were injecting with syringes into gaps in stone just so that that piece of stone stayed there rather than having to be replaced and they held it back in and it was therefore the same stone so that they weren't just mm-hmm. taking St. Giles down and starting <clears throat> again. And when you see that level of expertise and understanding of exactly what to do in each space and how bits work, and you think actually you've you've got to you've got to recognise that quickly, mm. recognise those people who've got the experience, recognise people who know more than you, and not be not be embarrassed by that. Mm-hmm. To just go, do you know that's not my job? Mm-hmm. I can tell you what I want it to look like. I can tell mm. you what I need it to feel like and be how it needs to be done. Yeah. I'm going to let you decide how it's actually put together because that's really what you do. Mm-hmm. I don't know stone that well. I still don't know <clears> stone that well. I can tell if someone's doing it really badly. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it was really, I suppose, one of those early lessons of just accepting that other people are more experienced. And is that how it works in, in architecture? Because, I mean, obviously you do the design, you build, you know, so you can visualise it at least yeah. on a bit of paper and probably 3D, but then you have to hand that over to the person who then builds it, I guess. Yeah, I mean, we, we well, have an input. Yeah, We yeah. have to know how it goes together. We have to understand the thermal properties and how it complies with the regulations and the insulation side of it. Uh, thankfully, not the structural side because we work with engineers on that but much more about understanding and and working with contractors. Um, It used to be really adversarial. It used to Mm. be that we were kings and we told everyone what to do and we expected people just to get on and do. Um, And the the realisation, I think, for the industry, uh, certainly one I had, not just through that, but through many, many episodes like that, is that if you've got contractors, if you've got people who've built things for 10, 20 years and really know what they're doing and that's their core business, why would you ignore them? Mm -hmm. So we would bring them in, try and bring them in early, try and understand... Not just, you know, as you say, you can draw it in three dimensions, you can do any of those, but until you realise that that won't float while they build the other part of it and it's <laughs> got to be done in sequence and someone actually has to physically do it with bits of timber, bits of stone, bits mm. of steel, you know, mm. actual physical materials that mm. don't just bend and move the way you mm. might want them to. So, it, you know, it's all about, it is all about collaboration. We say that all the time mm-hmm. and quite often we are all very collaborative until there's a problem and then we quickly withdraw to our own corners and defend ourselves. But <laughs> but it really is about collaborating and, and understanding those benefits and experiences from people who really know what they're doing mm-hmm. and finding that team. Um, mm-hmm. I suppose people, we were chatting earlier, weren't we, that idea of how, how can architects practices get so big? Mm-hmm. Um, how have they got so many people? What do they do? And it's about understanding that we've all got different skill sets. Um, and architects is a really broad thing and there are very few there are some there, I've worked with some amazing people over the years there are some really good people who are just genuinely good all-rounders but there's not many of them and there's fewer mm. every year I think it's becoming so specialist that we've got some some people in the office some of the team who are really really good at a specific sector or at a, per, a particular piece of the design process we've got some really gifted designers we've got some technically brilliant people but they can't do what each other do very well. Yeah, yeah. So it's about getting a big enough team that you cover all of those bases properly. Yeah. And if we do that within the studio, then why would we not do that with a wider design team and with the contracting and the whole project yeah. team? Yeah. Uh, and and get that whole how how do we get the product as good as it can be? Because ultimately, mm. that, that's what it's about. It's about mm. you know what does the end user end up with? What's the experience? Whether it's just for the people in the building, the wider community, the people around it. And that takes all of us doing our jobs well, mm. rather than just an architect coming in going, "I'll tell you how, it, I'll tell you all how it should be done," mm-hmm. uh, yeah. which I think is what we we used to be seen as doing. And so, how how do you help protect the younger guys coming into the industry and into your team um, from making the same mistakes that you did around kind of? Do you know, sometimes you just have to let them make them. All right, so yeah, <laughs> uh, it's all about the individual, isn't it? Some people will learn from your mistakes. Some people will. <coughs> 
you can chat to them, you can tell them stories. Stories are great for mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. You can tell them what you've been through. They can all laugh at you. Um, but some people won't actually learn from that. No. They'll hear it and they're not interested. So you've got to find a space that they can make mistakes. Mm -hmm. You've got to find somewhere safe that they can try it. Mm -hmm. um, it's about checks and balances, I suppose. It's, it's about putting a structure in place that says, we're not going to put you in a back office where you do tiling schedules for supermarkets or mm. hotels or whatever. We're going to give you a project to run. We're going to get you involved in a job with a support team there and, and we know what it should look like. So there's reviews and there's checks and there's balances mm. and there's more experienced people looking over their shoulder, checking up on it as they go. Mm. Um, but it's all about letting them exper experiment, letting mm. them experience it and, and letting them understand the difference between the university side where it's, you know, you're your own client. Go and design anything you want. And, you know, it's, it's really unrealistic. Mm -hmm. Whereas this is about, you know, there are deadlines, there are costs, there are, mm -hmm. there are really fixed contractual positions that have to be met. Um, and it's, it's letting them understand that, but in a way that doesn't impact them too much, uh, that mm -hmm. they can grow from it rather than getting too stressed out by it or, or feeling exposed. So I think what we do is about trying to support them. It's about bringing them into that, mm -hmm. letting them see it. You know, we don't, you know, we, we don't have separate offices for senior members of staff. Everyone's in the studio together. Mm. So they see what's happening. They see the other people doing it. Um, I, I think we found lockdown was a real challenge for that because the, the younger team members didn't get the yeah. the incidental bit, the bit where yeah, they yeah. overhear it. Um, and they come over later and they say, what, what was that about? Um, mm. Or they see you come in from a meeting going, good grief, how are we going to fix that? Mm. Uh, that didn't happen. And and that's the challenges. I think the best way for our, our team to learn is to be around it. It's to Go to a building site, you know, come mm -hmm. and go on site, see what happens, get away from behind a screen, go and talk to builders, go and chat to the people on site. And mm -hmm. when they see your drawing, they go, you know, you know, you can't build that. You know, that doesn't work. <laughs> Why not? You mm -hmm. know, and, and understand it that way. And, and I think that's still the best way to do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so you went from this position then when you were kind of, you're, you're an architect by trade, mm -hmm. then you ended up joining in 2010 yeah um and then and then now you're md like yeah how does it go from the place of being you know being an architect and running a business are two very different things yes mm. so how how did that kind of transition from being the dude doing the drawings or whatever yeah, pretty to, much you know to to like running a team and you know talk us through that process yeah, that journey yeah. for you yeah so it, it's an interesting one i suppose for us architects traditionally we're, we're not good at business um, there's an awful lot of architects you'll see who don't succeed in businesses. We get really caught up in the design. Design's a really difficult thing to price. Mm. You know, how do you put a how do you put a figure against time when you don't know how long something's going to take because you don't know what the answer is? Um, you start with a blank sheet of paper. Uh, it's not like we don't produce in a a unit idea where we know exactly what a unit costs us to make mm. and we monetize that and we can just work out how long it takes to produce and there's our cost basis. We have a, every set of problems is different. Every set of clients is different. You nearly always start with a broadly blank sheet and have to turn it into something. So a lot of architects aren't good at business mm -hmm. um, because they're so caught up in the, the getting the design right yeah. and the beauty of it all. Um, <clears throat> I just found that business interested me. Uh, in the same way that I like designing buildings, I like designing structure. I like designing mm. organizations. Um, the idea of the best of it coming out of getting a team right uh, was the bit that then made me think that actually, well, if, if you could sculpt your own team, that might be the interesting bit. Um, even at uni, we, we did group projects at uni and they were the ones I really enjoyed because you really quickly just established who was a grafter who just produced but hated doing presentations who was conceptually brilliant, but couldn't do the technical part. Um, and I would always try and get a team that covered all those bases and say, look, I'll do the briefing, I'll do the front end, I'll do any presentations you want, I'll muck in and do whatever needs done. But if you guys hate standing in front of a room of people and being critiqued, I'll do that bit for you. Mm -hmm. That has never worried me in the slightest. Mm -hmm. The bit that worries me is churning out 400 drawings mm -hmm. um, when I'm trying to figure out a junction and how that all works and the detail. Yeah. That's never been the bit I've loved. Yeah. So I started probably during uni to think about, well, I can't decide to do that going forward if I'm not in charge. If I don't run so it. So you were already thinking at that yeah. point, I'd like to kind of run my own show. Either run my own or, or be somewhere in an organization that gave me a team to run. Uh, I got opportunities in, in a practice. My, my immediate director in the first practice was off being the president of RIS. And then while he was away, they found a brain tumor. Um, so he never returned to the practice. Um, oh. And he's he's fine. Um, 
but it, it meant he couldn't come back. And there was this sudden panic on, well, what do we do with all these projects that were Arnie's? Um, and I was working on four or five of them. So basically inherited them. I was newly qualified. There was support there from se from senior team, from other directors, but everyone else was quite committed to other project work. So I ended up doing that on the basis that there was support from other team members. Yeah. And very quickly you went, well, I can do those bits if there's mm. someone doing those drawings. Mm -hmm. And the idea of passing things down that you'd, you'd done at uni, but when you come in at the bottom of the tree, you never really get to do in the practice. Mm -hmm. It just happened very quickly. Mm -hmm. um, at the point that they then went bust, I was getting to the point of thinking, you could see the sign, something wasn't right. There was, it wasn't going brilliantly. The practice was, it was quite a nervous place, obviously cash flow related uh, in the run up to going under. And I was thinking seriously about, should I go and start up a moan? Should I, I had a couple of jobs with a couple of clients that I'd brought in. They weren't very big, but you know, you think that might be it. I could, I could just do these and it'll all be fine. Um, so I was thinking about it. And then I got a phone call from the then managing director of Aiken Turnbull to say, well, here you've gone bust. You guys are looking, you're looking for a job. We've had your name from one of our clients and from a QS as well. Do you want to come and have a chat? So mm. I went along and, and they offered me a job. And I said, look, I don't want a job. I, I want to know that there's an opportunity for me to progress. I'm only joining because this is my one opportunity where I've got a clean slate. I can start fresh if I want to. I could go and set something up myself. And uh, my my former business partner now said to me, look, we've all thought about that. Every architect does, but the reality will be, do you want to spend your life sitting at your kitchen table, winning work and then doing it and working till midnight, drawing something up because you've got a meeting the next day and there's no one else to do the job for you? Hmm. Or do you want to take the opportunity and potentially move into a role running something bigger? Where rather than having to build it from nothing, you step in and you're already doing bigger projects. And actually that scale of project appealed, that type hmm. of project appealed. I really liked health work. You can't really do that as a as a one man band. So yeah. there was that opportunity, and it, it just it worked for me. And then I worked pretty hard at getting mm -hmm. there, at kind of supporting that, and seeing how we got through it. And then it became just about relationships and about getting on well, winning work, about building those teams and getting a team of people around you that that actually believed in you and mm -hmm. saw that they would have opportunities if they backed you and they worked with you. Um, and that's where it kind of got to the point of, I suppose three years ago now, buying out my business partner, Dave, um, during the pandemic, very odd timing. Uh, I don't know if I'd do that again, to be honest, in terms of, you know, nine months into a national lockdown, having no idea what was going to happen, but we'd already decided that was when it was happening and mm. it was all set. He wanted to retire early, so mm. we went ahead with it. Um, but just that opportunity to say, guys, we're going to change the practice. We're going to change things around. Um, but we're gonna, we've been talking to you for years about this now and giving you opportunity and giving all the team members an opportunity to find what they liked and were good at and where they wanted to be in an organization. And if they wanted to progress, then showing them how to. Uh, so just that idea of design and structures. And, mm. and actually to me, that's, that is design. So sitting with those little bubble diagrams of, well, if we've got this many directors and this many associates, and then how do you get from there to there? And if, if someone comes in as a student, how do they become an associate? What, oh, yeah, how do we okay. give them a career path? And how do we allow them to progress so we can grow with with the staff we have? Um, and that was just a really interesting thing for me. I, I liked it. Um, and, and that let us develop. Yeah. And and you talk about, I like the way you just described that in terms of it's just a, it's just design, whether it's a building or whether it's an organization. And, and, and you, you talked earlier on about the engaging and enabling your team through the, yeah. the AGM. Yeah, tell, yeah. Us, tell us a bit about that. So we started eight years ago, we started running an AGM. So up until, I think as I said at the start, we, we were a local practice. So we were your little local practice that I grew another one and grew another one and grew another one. And they were pretty cellular. Uh, they were quite insular. There wasn't a lot of sharing between studios. There wasn't a lot of overlap. Um, we When I joined, we were in discussion about whether we had a Gala Shields office and a, and a Hoyk office. Now, I'm not from the borders. I, I'm from Edinburgh. Uh, I spent 10 years in Aberdeen. I didn't really get the borders rivalries very well. And I'd say, look, guys, it's 60 miles down the road. Why would you have two offices? You've got space in either of them. You could just pick up the whole team, drop them in. Um, and I was told, well, if you think that's the case, you go and tell them. <laughs> so I'll, I'll do that. I don't, I don't, what's the problem? Okay. <laughs> right, we might have to pay some travel expenses. How difficult can that be? They'll get to work together. They'll learn from each other. Simple. 
So I went and told them. Um, it didn't go brilliantly. We had, <laughs> for about a year and a half, we had two separate servers in Gala Shields. We had a Gala server and a Hoik server. And the Hoik team came in earlier and they left earlier and they didn't talk to anyone else. It was not far off having a wall down the middle of the room because wow. they just didn't want to be anywhere other than Hoik. Uh, and they didn't like change and they couldn't understand why we'd done this. So, so yeah, I mean, there was, there was wobbles and there was things like that. Um, but it was, I suppose to me, those bits of, if we're going to do this, we need all of those people with us. We, we can't, we used to be, you know, there was three directors and we did everything. There was people that worked for us. And you think that that's not a sustainable model in my mind. It's not, it's not an exciting model. It's not a model that anyone wants to work in. You want to have a group of people who are enthused to come into the office, mm -hmm. who, who like working there, all of whom are out <coughs> saying, I work at Aiken Turnbull, it's great. I get to do mm -hmm. this. Not, I can't wait till I leave. Or I'm doing this as a stepping stone to go out and do something else myself. So, one of the big problems we found was communications. How do we make sure everyone's on board? We might be sitting three directors in a room with a vision for something. How do we communicate? How do we make sure everyone's on board? So I pushed really hard to have just one point in the year where we got the entire practice together, mm. had to be off site so that no one was distracted by, well, I'll just go and check my email or I'm just going to ignore you all and sit in the corner and work. And we'll actually talk about what's the year been like What's the year going to be like? What do we want to do? And it started, I think we were at nine now. So I think we've done nine of them. And the first one was me talking for six hours. It was awful. Nobody engaged. <laughs> nobody listened. There was about three or four people who were who were interested in where the practice were going, but nobody else could see the value or the purpose at all. And we did it in a hotel on the borders. Our most recent one was in November. Uh, we rented, you know, with the Museum of Scotland on Chamber Street. Oh, yeah. And, and you've got that big tower on the corner mm -hmm. and there's a suite oh. of rooms in there so you get the the first floor above the entrance so there's this round boardroom space with this window that looks down the bridge um, and above that there's then this glass room you know high wall but then glass around the top you get a stunning view of the scene of the skyline Edinburgh and, and we have a meal in there um, break for lunch lunch in there and then everyone in I spoke for I don't know a th less than a fifth of the, of the day uh, at the event, each of the studio leads was there talking about what their studio was doing. Each of the sector leads was talking about their sector and where they wanted to take it. Um, our practice manager was yeah. talking about what we would do in the future. Our comms and marketing lead was talking about what we would do in terms of how we, why comms mattered, where our brand was going. And everyone was engaged, everyone yeah. was enthused. And the journey between these two points of yeah. 20 bored looking people in a room going, do we have to live through this? <laughs> to the follow-up, I suppose, to this year's one where we sent out questionnaires on what did you enjoy, what did you not enjoy, nice. what did we miss, what, what are we not mm. telling you? Yeah. And one of the things that came back was, you know, it was really interesting, but is there more financial information? How, how do we find these things out? Mm. So we went, well, okay, well, and it was, can you cover it next year? And we mm. said, well, we can do that, but what we'll do is we'll do a quarterly newsletter and we'll give you an update on where we sit each quarter then. Yeah. Um, because we thought, well, if we ask for people's opinion, We've got to then respond. We've got to engage. Yeah. There's no point in promising it and not doing yeah. it. So we've really pushed hard. So you're that. quite transparent now yeah, on, on the financials of the business. Yeah. So we sit them down, we go, yeah, here's, our, here's yeah. our targets. <clears throat> so we've just done a newsletter, just went out and we said, okay, here's our studios, here's what our targets are per studio. Um, and we then will update you each yeah. month on where that sits, how we're achieving. If we do well, you'll all benefit. Um, if we beat our targets, you all get a bonus. Um, and what's the impact of you doing that then on the team, just given that level of visibility? I think people know why they're doing it. Uh, they see their hard work paying off. I, I don't like architecture traditionally. You know, it's a, the more all-nighters you've pulled, then the better you are at your job and all yeah. the kind of kudos. We don't do that. I, I'm just not interested. Uh, I, I've never done an all-nighter in my life, never done one at uni, have no intention of doing an all-nighter for work. You just don't produce well. So... But we've got people that work really hard and um, we've got a really good team actually. And, and they do, they care about what they do and they put the time and effort in. And I think if you don't then show them what's been the result of that, if you don't show them that, you know, they've got a huge push to get a big job over the line and they don't see any change in their salary, they don't see any particular reward, they don't know what's happened, you don't really get them engaged. Yeah. Mm. I think if you say to people, look, we've had a bad year. Uh, we all need to pull together. We need to get the fees in. We need to make sure we're making enough money because we need to keep the team together. Then they do that. But we don't often do it the other way when we say, you know, we've had a really good year, let's reward you. Um, you yeah. know, people are, it, rather than driving it by fear of, you know, well, you might lose your job. 
Yeah. It's about saying, guys, if, if we all pull together, if we do well, here are targets that are achievable. They'll need a push, but they're achievable. Mm. And if you achieve them, then you should be rewarded. Mm-hmm. You know, it's not just about money staying at the top. We want to invest back into the practice. We want to grow the practice, but we want to invest in the staff we have. Mm-hmm. Um, so we've seen a real, a real improvement in engagement. Our, our staff are now much more interested in what's going on. They mm-hmm. get what matters in terms of the work they're doing equates to a fee going out at the end of the month. Mm-hmm. They understand the value of, oh, do you know, actually, we've, we've been asked to do all these extra things. Do we charge for them? And they now know that if the scope's completely different and we've had to do 50 changes on something, then they don't just go, well, I've just done it and sent it out because you know I didn't want to upset anyone. Uh, they realise that there's a cost and there's a value. So yeah, they'll yeah. flag them themselves. So they, they're more aware of how the business operates. Yeah. Um, and we've seen in a lot of them that they, they want to move up. Yeah. They see what the point is in progression. And and in, in terms of the, the obviously it's a, a business that was heels from the borders, yeah. but when did you get the Edinburgh office then? So Edinburgh opened just before I arrived. So it'd be 14 years we've had an Edinburgh office. Ah, right, sorry, years. Okay, yeah. um, but when I arrived, there was one guy in, in a rented space in Duddingston, right in the middle of the golf course. Um, yes. we, had, we had a little upstairs room in there with one yeah. guy in it. Um, we're now sitting, we, Edinburgh's now our head office. Yeah. Uh, we moved it this year, mainly because a lot of our clients south of the border couldn't pronounce Gala Shields. Uh, they just <laughs> really couldn't. Galashials, and you were just going, okay, it's oh, not worth it anymore. Just just, Edinburgh. We'll just move it to Edinburgh. Um, but we, you know, we, we bought a studio in Edinburgh six years ago now, huh? uh, six and a half years ago. Yep. Uh, we bought the place on Castle Terrace. Yeah. And that was really, uh, I suppose for us, that was the point we said, we're not going to be a local practice in the borders anymore. We're going to be a national practice that needs a proper head office or a proper yeah. presence in Edinburgh, in the centre. We want an EH1 postcode. We want to be in where things happen. Yeah. Uh, we didn't mean to buy it. It was actually a complete accident. We we were looking to leave Duddingson House, brought an advisor on board, who's a guy I'd known for years, um, to look and tell us what the market was like. Didn't have a timescale on it. And he, and he took us to go and see an office. We sent him a brief of the kind of thing we needed. And he got in touch and said, I found this office. Um, it's probably too early for you guys, but it'll give you an indication of you know the kind of thing a townhouse is like size wise mm. in that area. Do you want to come and see it? So and he said, but it's it's strictly off market. You know, it's it's really mm. nobody knows it's for sale. It's all below the radar just now. So he didn't even tell us the address. He said, I'll meet you um, just around the corner from what is now Wagamama's. It was the bank, the Royal Bank, I think, on the corner, mm. uh, yeah. Lothian Road and Castle Terrace. I'll meet you just around the corner there, and we'll show you. It. Drove into town, parked the car, walked back down along Castle Terrace to meet him. And there was this building on Castle Terrace with an absolutely massive riding sign on the front of it up for sale. So we got back and we went, well, it's, ov- it's obviously not this one. And he went, yeah, yeah it is. I went, well, it's not off market. There's a huge sign. Went, yeah, there was a bit of a mix up. So you think, well, okay, fine. We'll go and have a look. So we got in and there was people in there. There was occupiers in there packing up. And it had been a charity that was closing down. And they were packing their bags to leave because they were going to be out by the end of the month. Um, and we thought, okay, it's a bit of an awkward walk around this one. So we got shown the building and we liked it. And then he said, well, actually, it's, uh, there's, a, there's an offer in already as well. And we said, what, what do you mean an offer? We thought it was to rent. And he went, oh, no, it's for sale. So we thought, right, so it's for sale. It's not off market. They're already moving in, and he went. And there's an offer. And he, yeah, he said, let's get a coffee, and we'll see. We'll have a chat about it. And he was obviously a bit embarrassed because I've never had a proper agent agent buy me a coffee before. So he bought a coffee, <laughs> which was clearly an apology, and uh, we chatted about it for a bit. And he said, "Look, I didn't think it was going to go that way, but what do you think?" We went, well, it was, it was lovely. I really liked it. It was great. You know, the views of the castle from the studio at the yeah. front. It's lovely. Um, but if there's someone who's already in with a cash offer. We were looking at rent. We've not spoken to the bank. We've not done anything about this. And it was a Wednesday. And he, he phoned on the Thursday morning. He said, I can I can get a closing date on Friday. Do you want to go for it? Mm-hmm. I don't know. So I spoke to my business partner and he said, look, I'm away. I've got meetings down south. I'm getting out of communication all day. If you want to go for it, let's just go for it. But see what we think it takes. Make a decision. We'll just go for it. So just before lunchtime on the Friday, I thought, yeah, let's do it. Let's We'll, we'll take a punt. So I phoned him up and said, how much do you think you need? And he gave me a number because he said, look, the other guy's cash. It's a real cash offer on the table. So we're going to have to go a bit higher. So I said, let's, let's just do it. And he phoned back an hour later and said, right, it's yours. He said, I had to agree to one thing. Hope it's not a problem, but we need to close before the end of the financial year because there's a tax rebate involved in closing up the charity. So, but it needs to happen this financial year. Yeah. And that was Easter weekend. 
So it was three and a half weeks. And I was like, and he said, is that a problem? I said, well, I'll be fine, won't it? So then I phoned the bank manager and said, look, I just bought an office. So I put said, Centre of Edinburgh. And he was, did you not think, I didn't, I didn't even know I was going to buy an office until two hours ago. <laughs> I genuinely hadn't thought of it. So he sent someone round to have a look. This was obviously a few years back when they did that. And he went, how much do you pay for it? I told him, he went, brilliant, that's fine. We'll back it, don't worry. He said, mm, it's worth wow. more. Great part of town, no worries at all. And then we had to, although I'm not an all-nighter fan, we had to persuade our lawyers to pull an all-nighter to get the de- the, the paperwork done in time because it had to get closed. Wow. We just got the money transferred the, the day before the bank holiday, so it just went through in time. Uh, so it was one of those, either a clear sign that you shouldn't do that at all and it's just a mm. bit ridiculous, or it was, in my view, it was a sign that was meant to happen and it all worked out, it was fine. But it was that moment of, I had to then phone my wife actually and go, I've just bought a townhouse. <laughs> what? I went, and it's not for us. Uh, so can't live in it. There's no garden. It's an office. And she said, I didn't know you were moving. I was like, we weren't. <laughs> but now we're going to have to. And then we we were actually on holiday when the, tra- the sale went through. And I came back to do a submission really early. We went in the dud house first thing in the morning. Big old Georgian house with all these huge shutters, this antiquated alarm system. So I had to let myself in, did the alarm, opened up all the shutters, went up to my desk. There's nothing there. Whole office had been stripped. And the guys had decided to move a week early because they got a gap with the movers. So they'd moved and not thought to tell me. So I came back. Office had been shut. I thought the guys had left with all the computers. Whole place was shut. So I had to lock Duddings and House back up again, drive into town and try and park in the centre of Edinburgh um, to move into the new office, which I had a key for somewhere in the house. Um, so it was, it was a really odd kind of curtailed spell of buying an office in town. So is that, is that, was it annoying to you for someone to arrive a week early? Ali. Um, no, no. <laughs> we Kelly's fine. We Kelly's absolutely fine. I think it's important. <laughs> These things are worth it. So, but it, you know, it was it was a really good experience for us because that was the point we went. You know, we've now got not a how do you find our office? Yeah. Well, it's down this track through a ah, golf course. Yeah, yeah. But also for staff, it suddenly opened up this. Mm. You know, how do you get to the office? We well, just get the train to the centre of Edinburgh. Um, yeah. So for <clears> recruitment for us, we we've got most of our Edinburgh team don't currently live in Edinburgh. They used to, but they live in East Lothian or Fife yeah. or a few of them are in Edinburgh. One of them lives in Berwick-upon-Tweed yeah. because it's an easy training. Yeah. Um, yeah. And suddenly being right in the centre where it's a five-minute walk from Haymarket or Waverley, mm-hmm. it just works. Um, and that's been one of those bits that unlocked it for us. We thought it was going to be about having a proper presence and you know a good address and all those kind of mm-hmm. things. And actually that's worked, but it's really been about staff like it there's places to go for lunch. You can go for a beer after work. Yeah. Suddenly there's a bit of life around it rather yeah. than a Tesco petrol station, a five minute drive and that was all there was. Yeah. And that's, I suppose, another one of those bits when you've just, the realisation of having to take your entire staff team with you on that journey and get them to buy in and making what the business does work for them yeah. rather than just being somewhere they go to work. Um, yeah. So that they now like it better as well. So, and so, so, but it, that was a kind of a, a pivotal moment, I guess, yeah. which actually, to go back on your story, if you hadn't actually almost made that what seemed like an impulsive decision to say, yes. yeah, let's just buy that, yeah. then the benefits I that don't think we would have got those. It's, it's, it's a real, it is one of those moments you look back and you just think, most people, when you tell them that, go, but why did you buy it? You know, you yeah. didn't actually have the money. Yeah. Um, but actually, when you look at it now, you go, well, we wouldn't, we wouldn't be in the position we're in now if we hadn't. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, that that just and it unlocked the key. I mean, for me, wow. was the staff it unlocked, the yeah. ability to recruit and to bring people on board who went, yeah. that's viable now. I'll do that. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I Amazing. believe you because I come in and it's a nice office and there's a view of the castle and suddenly they, it's, like, yeah. it's a good place to work. Yeah, Amazing. Yeah, we found that as well. With you know, we debated about whether having a studio in town was was the right decision, but you know, and there's definitely lots of good options on the outskirts. With way more space, you know, yeah. especially. For you, it's like, oh, I want to have more space so I can design. You know, yeah, like yeah, you, you kind of want that. But actually, you know, the the even just the idea, as you say, just like being in the the hub of town and like the, you know, mm. it, it brings like a, it's maybe not work ethic. That maybe isn't the right word, but it brings like an element of like, I'm coming to do big things in a big city yes. and we go in big places and it's and it's unwritten, you know. And, there is, yeah, there's there's just a feel. It's a yeah, kind of yeah. mood or that, and, and it's that buzz, even, the, you know, I'm in, I'm in the 50% that love the festival of Edinburgh residents. Yeah. <laughs> I love the buzz. I love the fact that it feels like a city and it's exciting. Yeah. Um, and and for us, that move from 
the edge of Edinburgh in the middle of a golf course, which was lovely and peaceful and quiet mm. and all those things into the centre of town. It feels a bit like that all the time. Yeah. There's a bit of life yeah. and you bump into people. You bump into people in your industry yeah. um, or in other industries, you bump into clients in the street because you're all in the same part of town yeah. going for lunch. You see them at the end of the day. You go, oh, I didn't mean to catch up. Do you, do you want to catch a coffee now? Yeah, yeah. As opposed to scheduling something three months in advance yeah. uh, when you find a gap in your diary that you then cancel. Yeah. And I, yeah. I think you're right. I mean, for us, it made sense to be on the edge edge of Edinburgh mm-hmm. because it was easier to get between Edinburgh and Gal Shields. You could hit the offices more smoothly. But actually, as an organisation, being in the centre from a, from a team point of view is much better. Yeah. And now suddenly you just get the train at Gala. Yeah, you yeah. Know? It's yeah. quicker, it's easier rather than the being on the edge and having to drive everywhere. Yeah. I'd be, I'd be intrigued to hear what you, what you thought about. So, you know, COVID was obviously a, a crazy time. Uh, I think we could talk about COVID forever, yeah. but I guess I, what I'm intrigued about from your point of view is, is as someone who's so passionate about like the space that people interact within, yes. mm. um, the, the creativity that's involved in that, you've kind of spoke a little bit about that, but you know, how important is it for businesses to take into consideration the environments that their people work in? You know, we try to make it nice here because yeah. we're creatives and we want to be in a creative space and actually investing in that we feel is worth it. Yeah. You know, I'd love to hear what you think of that. Yeah, I, th- I think it's an interesting one. We found that in our own workspace, COVID was, you know, yeah, it came with challenges. But in a sense, it was a really important accelerator for us. It prompted a lot of change in how we operate as an organisation. Um, mm-hmm. We still were of that opinion, most of us, that you needed a big space to lay down all these huge drawings and that was the only way of working. And because you couldn't do that, you found you could do it online and suddenly you realised that actually that worked and mm-hmm. therefore you didn't need that big space. Um, so for us as an organisation, there were some real positives in terms of accelerating the change. I think in an environmental one, it was probably a really useful one. What it made us realise is that you can work anywhere and I think most people can. You know, there's some, there's some roles you can but you can broadly work anywhere in most roles that we do now. You know, we're broadly a service economy and therefore, you know, all you need is an internet connection and probably a pair of headphones if you're somewhere noisy. That's about it. Um, but what you miss is community. What mm. you miss is the is the the element of overlapping with other people. Um, even, even for people who are not necessarily hugely outgoing, just being at the other side of a room when there's other folk chatting, it's enough to just make you feel connected to what's happening around you. Mm. And, I, and I think we've realized that how people use their spaces and how you bring that sense of life and well-being into it is so important. Mm. Um, you know, there, there's, a, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of pushback on open plan working spaces and things like that. Mm. Um, my view on them is always that open plan is actually a really good thing. I think, I think it's a great thing if it's done properly. Mm-hmm. And what it needs is it needs a lot of support accommodation. So mm-hmm. if you've got a really good open plan space, it's probably because you've got some, lots of lots of small bookable meeting rooms, lots mm-hmm. of little booths, lots of little phone spaces, little teams rooms, all yeah. those kind of things. So that the open plan is only for the bits when you really want to be in a space with other people. It's about choice. It's about the type of environment to do the type of work you do rather mm-hmm. than that one size fits all thing. Yeah. And I think a lot of that's prompted it. A lot of that has been driven by the move, not just because of COVID pushing everyone out, but trying to get people back into offices, trying to get mm-hmm. people back into a workspace because they've realised they can work from home. So it's now about making it a really compelling space that people want to be in. And it's not like the kind of early dot-com thing where you say, well, just stick some beanbags and a pool table and that'll <laughs> make it really cool and folk will want to be there. Because it's actually, people are people are now really keen on the idea of, yes, those activities, yes, that camaraderie, but I want a space that I can get my work done mm-hmm. so that I can finish work and feel like I've achieved something and then go home mm-hmm. so that I can, or go out or go to the next thing. But the, they want a space to actually deliver an achievement. So mm-hmm. putting people in a really noisy space that they can't focus in, but going, but it's cool because there's like, there's music and there's a pool table. It doesn't work anymore. Mm-hmm. Giving them a set of spaces where they can actually achieve and feel like they've achieved, mm-hmm. but overlap with colleagues, ask for help, See, mm-hmm. see other people, all those things that we missed. Yeah. Um, yeah. And also the benefit of that commute of, I've gone to work, I've come home from work, I can mm-hmm. leave it there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's, yeah. Not, it's not at the other side of the dining table forevermore. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that's that's one of those big drivers. Mm-hmm. It, it's realizing about quality of environment, mm-hmm. um, not just cramming in. Uh, and that's not just workspace, that's housing, you know, yeah. huge volume housing where everything's squeezed and squeezed and squeezed to its tightest set of parameters. And going, you know, people want a bit of outdoor space. They want things to breathe a little. Mm-hmm. They want a bit of space from the other people they live with. Um, healthcare, where you think, if we just design to the, the cost metric of 
how do we get as much as we can from our budget, which is really important. But there's a lot of free things like views and light mm-hmm. that if we get that in, we know have a benefit. Yeah. We know art in a hospital improves people's experience. Art. Know, art know. does, yeah. Right. We know that views out in yeah. natural world and daylight actually helps people get better quicker. Fresh air, all those things. We've got to work with that as well rather than just throwing money at it or using the budget as an excuse. So I think, I think COVID... Mm. And, and the follow-on from that has made us realize about quality of environment rather than quantity is probably the important mm. bit. It's about getting more from your space. Do you know, it's interesting that you say that because I, um, you, you, you know my office, obviously, mm-hmm. and uh, <clears throat> I had the opportunity to move into a bigger office at the other side of the building. I right? want a, a bit more space. And I realized, actually, do you know what? I had, I've got such a good view from yeah. my office window. I thought... I can't trade that mm. for a bit bigger space, but yeah. a lesser view. Yeah. So, you know, that, as and you, you say, say the, what do you need the extra space for? Yeah. For meetings, we'll just have them somewhere else. Yeah. Do you know, and you, you start doing that yeah. and it works whether you're I a agree. massive corporation or two or three, two or three people in a room. It's yeah. that bit of the view, the space, the light, all those things, they matter. Yeah. yeah. I mean, we totally. can't just put people in pens anymore, like those little cubicles oh, you see in all the American films gosh. and realise <laughs> you wonder why they're off sick. Do you know? Yeah. yeah. It's yeah. a horrible place to work. Yeah, that's yeah. right. Amazing. So as we kind of near the end, we always ask um, our, our guests on, what is your guiding principle in business? My guiding principle? Mine is, is, is just care. And I think, I think that, that extends across the whole thing. So it's caring, about, it's caring about your team. It's caring about your cash flow. It, it's caring about your product. It's caring about what your output is, your reputation, um, yourself. Um, you know, mm. there's that realization that if you're not around, then does the business function? Um, I'm just back from some days up north on holiday. Uh, I turned my phone off. I was away. Do you know, I came back. Everything was fine. We all kept turning. I wasn't needed. There was no disasters. And you realize that actually that matters. The ability to mm. do that. Um, because then I come back and I've got energy and I can do the next bit. Um, but, but really for us, I think, it, for me certainly, it's just caring. Because that means... You know, you're thinking about your client. You're thinking about what does your client want that building to do, but also you're thinking about the people around. That what does the building do for the wider community? Mm. You know, the 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 thing about what we do is that nothing nothing you design ever lives in complete isolation. Other people, other than the person who's paying for it, will interact with it, um, and you've got to think about them too. But you can't expect your client to have to pay for that privilege. So you've got to do it in an intelligent way. So it's about the spaces in between. It's about the communities it creates. And and for me, caring is that bit where it just covers the whole thing. Mm-hmm. You can sit with the team and, and tell them if they care about themselves, if they care about their team members, if they care about their end users, if mm-hmm. they care about their budget. It all just kind of runs across it, I find. So. Mm. Amazing. Alex, it's been great to, to have you on. Um, it's been great to hear a bit of your story um, and uh, good luck with everything in the future. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, thanks for having me. Thanks, Ali.